The fundamental theorem of arithmetic is a fancy name for something you've probably known for most of your mathematical life. You might recall creating factoring trees from elementary or middle school math classes. These are diagrams where you start with a number and try to factor it into the product of two smaller numbers, and then repeat the process until you end up with numbers that no longer can be factored. Those numbers at the bottom are called primes, and this process yields the prime factorization of the initial number. One of the easily observed and easily overlooked features of this exercise is that no matter how you factor at each step, the final factorization is the same regardless of the path that you took. That is, if you look at the final list of primes at the bottom of all the factoring trees, they'll be the same except for maybe being in a different order. This may seem completely obvious based on your experiences, but it turns out that there are many number systems for which this simply isn't true. For example, if we were to use the number system consisting of only even integers, there are numbers like 36 that we can factor as either 6 times 6 or 2 times 18, but neither of those factorizations can be broken out any further unless we use values that aren't even integers. There's an important lesson here about not letting your current set of experiences define the universe of possibilities. In fact, the discovery that unique prime factorization fails in other number systems opened the doors for new areas of mathematics, so sometimes you never know what's waiting around the corner. Here's the formal statement of the main theorem for this section. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic. For each integer n, there exists an increasing list of primes p1 through pr, such that n is the product of these primes, and this factorization is unique. A couple quick points about the statement of this theorem before we prove it. First, we allow the possibility of having the same prime repeated. In some treatments, you see primes raised to various powers. I tend to think that the powers make things look more complicated than they really are, so I like what the book does here. Second, notice the primes are listed in a non-decreasing order. This gets around the problem of having to track the potential rearrangements. It doesn't negatively impact the logic of the proof in any way. The proof will proceed by induction and will have two parts. The first will prove the existence of prime factorizations, and then we will prove that the prime factorizations are unique. Notice that if n is prime, then the prime factorization is just itself. For the existence proof, notice that since the number 2 is prime, we have an immediate prime factorization for it. Now suppose that the numbers 2 through k all have prime factorizations. We need to prove that k plus 1 has a prime factorization as well. If k plus 1 is prime, then we have an immediate prime factorization, just as with the number 2. If it is not prime, then we can write k plus 1 as a product of two integers that are both less than k plus 1. But by the inductive hypothesis, we know that each of these integers has a prime factorization. This means we can substitute to write k plus 1 as a product of primes. The last step for getting a prime factorization as stated in the theorem is just rearranging the terms to be in increasing order. For the uniqueness proof, suppose that 2, 3, up through k all have unique prime factorizations. Suppose that we have two factorizations of k plus 1 where all the primes are ordered as in the statement of the theorem. Notice that p1 divides the product of the q sub i so that p sub 1 equals q sub i for some i by corollary 2-4. Also, notice that q sub 1 divides the product of the p sub j, so q sub 1 equals p sub j for some j. Since the products are in increasing order, we must have these inequalities. But by combining them together, we get this, which shows that p sub 1 and q sub 1 must be equal. This means that we can cancel these terms out to get a factorization of a number smaller than k plus 1. By the inductive hypothesis, we know that this factorization must be unique so that the p sub j and the q sub i must exactly correspond to each other. And so we see that the initial factorizations were actually the same, proving that for all integers n greater than 1, we have unique prime factorization. The real key to the uniqueness proof was where we used corollary 2-4, which follows from the proof of the Euclidean algorithm. It turns out that in any number field where the Euclidean algorithm holds, you will also find unique prime factorization. We won't be exploring this idea any deeper in this class, but just be aware that there are places where the Euclidean algorithm fails, and this leads to other areas of mathematics. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future.